to welcome you to this afternoon's meeting of the Public Accounts Committee. Mobile phones must be set to airplane mode or turned off. It is not efficient to put mobile uh, phones on silent mode as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. This session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed via uh, live online streaming or Assembly website or Democracy Live. So for this afternoon's public session, then, we move to agenda item one, which is apologies. Have we any apologies? All present. Um, agenda item two, then, is minutes of the 19th of November, which are in your pack, pages 7 to 11. Any members, any uh, questions, comment to make on those? By your permission to sign them, as being accurate. Great. Great. Agenda item three then is declaration of members' interests. Have any members any declaration of interest to, to make this afternoon? Nope. Well, we're discussing the issues papers of special educational needs, so a governor yeah. of uh, Rodenfield Primary School. Okay. Any others? Yeah, Governor of Rodenfield Primary School. Mr. Governor of Priory and Forgetter College in Hollywood. Okay. Uh, Chairman, Nice Cullen, did you I am a governor of Girls Model and Edinburgh Primary School in Belfast. <coughs> uh, agenda item four then is matters arising. I referred to a copy of the correspondence dated the 18th of December 2020 from the Northern Ireland Office, by Northern Ireland Audit Office, to Renewable NI, which is in your pack pages 14 to 19. This is in response to a complaint from Renewable NI to the Northern Ireland Audit Office in respect of its report into generating renewable energy. Um, Mr Donnelly, would you like to brief the committee around that? Uh, yes. Uh, when we published our report on renewables, uh, there was a lot of public debate on uh, just the rates of return to for small-scale wind turbine operators. And um, renewables, and I was challenging our figure work. Uh, so this here is a very detailed response. Uh, we're actually, uh, we can stand over our figure work and we're happy with it. Uh, we'll also be getting points raised at the opposite end of the spectrum that our, our figure work was too conservative. <laughs> um, I think when we do calculations of this nature, we, we do we, we, we are quite prudent in, in how we put them together. Uh, so uh, now there'll be an opportunity for this committee to explore all of that in more detail whenever we give you a more fulsome briefing on that report. Okay, members, any questions? Intent? Great. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Members, at last week's meeting, we discussed Belfast City Council's correspondence in response to our letter regarding the planning application regarding Casement Park, specifically in reference to the blue light regulations. Uh, the clerk e emailed Belfast City Council for further uh, clarification following her uh, examination of the draft concert and has been informed that the notice opinion has now been issued and the council has indicated that DAFI can proceed. However, she was unable to get clarification on the blue light regulations, uh, and I think, to be honest, you know, we looking at Hansard here. Whenever this issue was raised, um, uh, took three or four attempts in the questioning to try and get an answer, and we haven't yet got, got <coughs> clarification. And I know the clerk has been speaking to the head of the planning, Belfast City Council, and still we are struggling to get clarification. So I'm in your hands, Mr. Hillage. Sure, yes, it, it, it's, it is a bit concerning because what you don't want to happen is for the same thing to happen as what happened the last time. You need to learn lessons from things. Yes. Well, obviously, it was a judicial review the last time I've actually sort of uh, brought the thing to an end. There was also those safety aspects as well, which should have been ironed out long before they were. And if they don't get it done again, they're going to end up with another disappointment if they don't. If it's not complying with the blue light table, what what strikes me, and as a, a former member of Belfast City Council who sat in the Health and Environment Committee, as a former member of the Decal Committee, is that 
around these issues, the certification comes, the sign-off comes from local government. Um, and if Belfast City Council internally isn't aware who's meant to be dealing with these things, that it does give me cause for concern. Uh, and you're quite right. Um, we we had in, before we uh, we took evidence as a decal committee. We had uh, evidence given by um, Mr. Andrew Hazard, who was then the director, and Valerie Brown, who was the safety officer at Belfast City Council, and also. We had um, one stage, Mr. John Walsh, the town solicitor, in front of the committee. So what I think, uh, if the members are in agreement on this, is to get absolute clarity around it, that I write to the chief executive of the council uh, and ask for clarity around these things, because realistically, I think any response coming, what I want to see in terms of response coming here, is a response where the council, having sought um, the the... Uh, views and the position, the ag exact, the absolute position of the council around these things, from the person responsible. And if that person isn't Valerie Brown now, whoever the, Valerie Brown's replacement is, and currently in that role, and it may well still be her. I, I'm just not over it entirely because I'm no longer a member there. But I, I think that's what we need to do. Write to the chief executive of the council to get that clarity. Members agreed? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's an action I, I write to. Suzanne Wiley, the Chief Executive of the Council. Okay, agenda item five, correspondence, pages 21 to 56. Um, <coughs> members are referred to correspondence dated uh, the 12th to the 23rd of November from Mr. Edward Cook at pages 21 to 40 of your pack in relation to COVID-19 and Northern Ireland Universities. Um, Mr. Cook continues to copy us into correspondence, and we will continue to consider that at our meetings. However, if this is not um, directly related to the work of the Public Accounts Committee, are you content to note? Members content? <coughs> content. Thank you. Members, I refer to correspondence dated the 16th of November 2020 and 20th of November from um, Professor Bartholomew regarding the Ulster University Belfast campus at pages 41 to 49 of your pack. This is in response to the committee's request to follow up information from the evidence session of the 5th of November 2020. Correspondence dated the 16th of November includes information on the University Council membership and roles and remunerations. Uh, Professor Bartholomew also notes the committee's request to return to the committee in six months' time. Um, the correspondence dated the 20th of November uh, includes information on the projected capital receipts for Jordanstown campus uh, and any live litigations and the £25 million spending uh, regarding COVID-19. Please note this correspondence is marked private and confidential and I would ask you to respect uh, and treat it as such. Uh, any members, any comments uh, <coughs> they would like to make, although not around the issues of no, the, those that are marked confidential, I wouldn't want that raised in open session to respect the correspondence from the university. Anyone? Mr Muir? There's a letter dated the 16th of November. Do you want to deal with that afterwards or do you want to deal with that in, in conjunction with the current letter? Because it's not marked private and confidential and it's about the appointment of the council and stuff mm. like that. No, well, I, don't, I don't think the appointment of the council would no. be something which would be dealt with, in, 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 because I, I, my opinion is that should be in the public domain. Well, yeah, my, my query about that letter is that um, it states about how the, uh, it says lay members are appointed, appointed through a public recruitment process based upon a rule description and person specification which is reviewed for each appointment. Um, my reading of this, just from reading it, um, is that they essentially they do the recruitment of their own members. And I would be interested to know what oversight there is from the sponsor department, which is the <coughs> Department of the Economy, in terms of that, um, because it doesn't look like there is. No, I think a number, uh, whenever um, Mr. Bartholomew gave evidence, and I think a number of people during the session and after and a wash up held, held the view that this all looked uh, very sort of um, cosy and, and, and um, you know, this day and age, I think uh, it would be absolutely appropriate. That these things are, are, in terms of recruitment, carried out in a, in a due and appropriate and open and transparent way. Um, so, 
I have no difficulty if you if you would like something to be sent to ask for further clarification around that. Yeah, with the oversight of the Department of the Economy in relation to that, you know, yeah. not just the appointment of the line members, but just the appointments generally, you know, in terms of. So ask how they're appointed, and then separate, and they, you would send that to the the university itself, and then yes. and then a separate letter to the department asking what their role is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Members agreed. <coughs> okay. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, members, I refer to correspondence to the Economy Committee from the Department of the Economy uh, dated the 19th of November, pages 50 to 51 of your pack. The Economy Committee has forwarded to us a copy of the written update on the funding of the Ulster University Belfast ca campus. Are members content to note and forward to the Northern Ireland Audit Office? Great. Okay, members, I refer to correspondence dated the 19th of November 2020 from Sue Gray, the Accounting Officer and Permanent Secretary of the Department of Finance. At pages 52 to 56 of your pack to confirm attendance at the evidence session on the 3rd of December 2020 on capacity and capability in the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Are members content to note? Agreed. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, then, members, we will continue an open session for item 6, which is a briefing session into the inquiry uh, and capacity and uh, capability, and there's pages 58 to 187 of your pack. And at this stage, I uh, invite Mr. Kieran Donnelly, the Comptroller and Auditor General of the North Ireland Audit Office, to table Mr. Rodney Allen, uh, Director of the NIAO, Ms. Christine Burns, Audit Manager, Mr. Connor McGeown, Senior Auditor, Mr. Kyle Bingham, Assembly Support Officer, will join the meeting remotely. Broadcasting, can you? Bring Mr. Allen, Mrs. Burns, Mr. Connor, and Mr. Bingham into the meeting. And can I just ask all of those folk, can you hear us? And could you speak now or forever hold your peace so that we can know that we can hear you? Yes, Chairman. Yes, Chairman. Yes, Chairman. Kyle. We can't hear you, Kyle. Apologies, yes, Chairman. Right. We can hear you now. Good. Okay, um, so thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, uh, members, this is the fourth inquiry, uh, is in our fourth inquiry is into capacity and capability in the Northern Ireland Civil Service. The Audit Office reports are in your pack 58 to 159. There, will be, there was a minor amendment to the original report regarding two footnotes that are amended in your pack. Um, so, also in your pack, then, are our biographies, pages 160 to 163, of Sue Gray, uh, Jill Min, Michelle Woods, and Anne Breen, who will be uh, coming with Sue Gray to the session. Uh, and they are, uh, there's also a Northern Ireland Audit Office restricted paper at 164 to 178 of your pack. Okay. Um, I will remind members that we, we are uh, in open session. Okay, Mr. Donnelly, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, this is a very important report, uh, and you may recollect, you know, problems around capacity and capability have uh, been thrown up. Can I just ask? Can I just ask, folks? Some of you may be um, unmuted. Can I ask you to mute your mics at this stage, if you don't mind, because there's a considerable amount of feedback. Uh, if, if that would be okay. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Chair. Now, just to say this is, um, it is a very important report uh, and issues around capacity and capability keep cropping up in all our other reports uh, and your reports as well on the committee. Uh, so we thought that, you know, there was a strong case for having a, a deeper look at capacity and capability issues across the, the civil service. Uh, and also part of our thinking was the was the outworkings of the RHI inquiry. Uh, it had uh, many, many recommendations, but uh, a good chunk of those recommendations are related to capacity and capability issues. So that's why we decided it was important to get into this space. Uh, and um, I'll just pass over to Rodney. He can talk you through the you know the detailed issues in in the report. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Rodney. Good afternoon. Okay. Tell me through, Chairman. Um, good afternoon, Chairman, members. Um, in your pack, you have our written brief. 
Uh, if you're content, I'll take about 10 or 15 minutes to give you a verbal brief. Is there feedback? Just before, just before you get in, the, the, the level sounds maybe a bit, not that I'm very tactical around these, the level seems a bit high. If you could reduce it a bit, maybe there's a bit of sort of feedback. It sounds as if there's you and then somebody speaking quickly after you. And I know there's only one Rodney Allen, so. <laughs> I think, Chairman, part of the problem might be that the three of us are in the one room here. All right, okay. And I'm wondering if we might need to relocate. Um, yeah. Help. Might be a problem at our end. Uh, I'm, I'm being told by those who know these things that that might be helpful. That happened last week. Yeah, that, that does happen. Yeah. Yeah. If you give us just a couple of minutes, that, we'll, we'll sort it out at our end, Chairman. That, that's okay. Um, we, we'll do that. We, we'll give you a few minutes until you indicate when you want to come back to us. Is that okay? That's great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Members, when we, when we uh, conclude um, this session, we will then go into closed session. Uh, to deal with some issues uh, in relation to next week's uh, session where we will have Sue Gray and her team with us uh, around uh, which will be our first evidence session external to the audit office around uh, this issue so uh, we will then deal with that in closed session um, immediately we're finished the session with, with the audit officer members content mm -hmm. I also then just deal with um, while we're waiting uh, couple of issues. We, we have agreed to take evidence right up to the week before Christmas as a committee. Um, and uh, I was talking to the clerk and the assistant clerk earlier. In terms of the new year, uh, in terms of recess, we are uh, in recess until the 18th yeah. um, is when Stroman comes back. I was proposing with your agreement that this committee would meet and so that's Monday the 18th is when the, the first plenary would be held. I was proposing that we would meet Thursday before that, which I think is the 14th, uh, for a, a meeting where we would look and plan our way forward for the period between January and the new year through to Easter. Would members be happy with that? So we'd meet at 2, two o'clock on the Thursday the 14th. Is that okay? Members agreed? Okay. All right. Um, Okay, Rodney. Thursday, Thursday the fourteenth. Did you say is that is that Thursday the sixteenth, by any chance? Or am I in the wrong? No, it couldn't be Thursday the sixteenth. Or seventeenth, rather. No, you're on. You're in December. Or is it January? Oh, January. <coughs> right, sorry. Okay. Thursday the eighteenth. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So thanks for that, members. We'll hand back to Mr. Allen. See if we're um, good to go. Rodney. Slightly better, better, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Christine's just leaving. I think we were, we were trying to do well organised with the three of us in one room, but obviously yeah, we, three laptops. We, 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 we did similar problems last week with the uh, Education Authority, and there were a couple of people in the room. Uh, there was considerable feedback as well. Uh, so um, we'll just. We're, we're watching. Hopefully that's us now. Is that okay now, John? It's slightly better, so, but I think we'll, we'll just, you just play ahead. We'll just have to make do. Okay, if, if it's too difficult, just, just give me the nod and I'll stop. Um, if, if, if you're okay, I'll take about 10, 11, 12 minutes and I'll try and rattle through this. Um, if, that's, if that's okay, Chairman? That's fine, that's fine. Great, okay. Um, members, we, we published our report last Wednesday, the 18th of November, so it's hot off the presses. A uh, bit of background, fieldwork in this study commenced back in September 2019, um, as well as extensive engagement with Northern Ireland civil service staff. We met with various stakeholders, including the GB civil service, the Irish government, NIPSA, FDA, civil service commissioners, and the Strategic Investment Board, and various others. We analysed statistics, data sets, along with conducting our own survey of the nine government departments. And all of that work has been underpinning the evidence and our findings and the conclusions in the report that we're presenting to you today. So the draft report went out to the Department of Finance in May 20. Um, clearance took until about a week or so there just prior to publication when we, when we finally got it over the line. We must, of course, acknowledge that some of that delay was due to the pandemic pressures that the department has been handling. Um, I want, to, in the opening remarks, to recognise actually the very constructive engagements with the department, most intensively with senior civil servant Janine Fullerton and her team. Um, Janine reported to Jill Min, who reported to Sue Gray, and whom we ultimately cleared the report with. 
So publication last week attracted quite a bit of media coverage uh, based on some subsequent representations to us and going by the extent of engagement with those media outlets, there has been quite some angst amongst current or former civil servants and the report has provided um, an opportunity for that to bubble up. So the civil service employs over 22,000 staff. It's Northern Ireland's third largest employer. And our report examines the extent to which the civil service workforce is sufficiently equipped in terms of its staffing numbers, its capacity, and its appropriate skills, knowledge, and expertise, its capability. Both of those absolutely necessary to deliver effectively um, government initiatives. So we highlighted that the service has indeed been facing unprecedented challenges in recent years. There's been substantial workforce restructuring, the voluntary exit scheme, and they've been dealing with the preparation for the, the, the exit from the European Union. And of course, they've been responding to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Uh, in and around all of this, the workload that the service faced uh, did not reduce. Um, and throughout that period, uh, I think it's important to note that the service has continued to deliver uh, vital services to, to the public. The, however, um, our report concluded that the civil service has indeed reached now a, a crossroads where it is struggling to deal with business as usual. So we structured a report around the following key parts. Um, the Northern Ireland Civil Service has had to deliver existing services whilst rationalising its workforce. Significant work is needed to address capacity gaps and a strong focus is required on building workforce capability. And despite work to transform the service to date and deliver a people strategy, there are clearly key challenges that remain. So essentially, this report has been a strategic piece of work, um, but out of necessity, it has brought to light issues in many, many different areas, some of which would indeed probably sustain an even deeper analysis. So just moving a wee bit more onto the detail, what did we find? Uh, well, our main findings are structured around a number of areas. First of all, resourcing and workforce planning. So workforce planning, in our opinion, has been inadequate uh, and the rap there's rapid civil service wide progress now needed uh, to address significant vacancies and reduce an ever increasing reliance on uh, temporary staffing solutions. The civil service is a very aging workforce. Uh, at March 2019, some 45% were over the age of 50 and that to us emphasizes the importance um, for succession planning and, and effective workforce planning to really ensure the capacity and the civil service is not eroded further. Less than 1% of the staff uh, are aged between 16 and 24. Prior to 2019-20, we had five of the nine departments who had no workforce pl plans in place. Now, steps were taken in 2019 and a planning template was introduced, but three departments um, couldn't even provide us with draft plans in response to that template. Vacancy rates have increased to nearly 7%, necessitating the use of various temporary staffing solutions. So for instance, temporary promotions are now over 8% of the workforce, and all six departments that provided those draft workforce plans that I touched on there had temporary promotions lasting um, in excess of four years. Agency staff costs have increased by 155% in the two years to £46 million. Pounds. Uh, the anticipated expenditure on the agency worker framework was £105 million. Can you just uh, that point again for me there? The, the, sure, the, sure. The cost of the agency workers? Agency worker costs have increased by 155% in, in two years um, to total now £46 million. That was there, there was a framework put in place. Sorry, there is a framework in place. And the expected agency worker um, expenditure on that framework was £105 million. Pounds. But as of August, that has already been exceeded by a further £48 million, pounds, so in excess of £150 million pounds in agency workers in four years. So move, moving on, um, Chairman, members to recruitment. Uh, in our opinion, the, the current system, um, uh, the approach used by the civil service, it's cumbersome and it's subject to significant delay. It really doesn't support a modern day civil service operating in this rapidly changing environment that, that we have presented to you. Eight of the nine departments them, told us themselves they're not satisfied with the time taken to um, recruit and place candidates. There have been some suggestions brought to their attention. It's in the report of manipulation or gaming um, of appointment lists. 
So that really is, is departments holding back on notifying vacancies until they, they perhaps are aware of um, certain individuals on, on lists that they would particularly like. Interestingly, following publication of the report just last week, we've been approached by, by someone who had a few approaches, but someone who has advised us of at least um, two people recently found suitable for DP positions um, who were removed from the appointment list because they would not accept full-time posts. Now, we haven't probed that, but it is just an interesting um, observation. For general service grades, and they, they account for approximately two-thirds of the workforce, Appointments to general service grades, they're not for specific roles. So recruitment and selection arrangements don't always assess the skills and the experience, um, nor consider um, the skills and the experience when actually placing individuals into the posts. So in essence, that brought us to really the strap line for, from this particular report, which is you need to ensure the placement of the right people in the right posts at the right time. So we concluded quite heavily that a written branch review of recruitment um, is needed. On skills, um, we feel that a much stronger focus is required on developing the functional skills within the civil service workforce. So these skills differ quite significantly from those that are currently recognised in language of professional and, and technical um, skills and grades. So functional skills would include things like, and something that the committee to date has been very interested in, project management, contract management, uh, service delivery. Now, in, in the main, those are carried out in the current environment by general service staff. Uh, five departments reported to us key skills gaps in those areas, and that indeed has potentially been um, a factor behind the increasing uh, reliance of the service on specialist staff deployed from the Strategic um, Investment Board. So other skills that we find reading across and having a look elsewhere, and in this instance in the GP civil service, include skills such as counter fraud, uh, debt, data, digital technology, commercial skills, um, and we're just not clear on whether the existing um, professions in Northern Ireland would currently have the ability to deliver specialist skills of that nature to civil service departments. Now, some progress has indeed been made on the journey to, to upskill, and we have noted examples of that in the report. However, in our opinion, we feel that efforts have been sporadic and, and they've lacked strategic direction. Only four departments have undertaken any form of skills audit, and we find really little evidence that the service has adequately identified the importance of functional skills, um, considered the range of functional skills, the knowledge, the experience, which it works for, its workforce already possesses. Um, indeed, the requirements also for delivering successfully in relation to uh, programs for government. So the service really urgently needs a skills model that best suits its needs. So a couple of other areas that, 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 that our, our findings landed in. Um, performance management. Uh, we, we, we looked at the analysis of performance ratings in the 2017-18 year. Now, that's the most recent available to us. Identified significant shortcomings, really, in the effectiveness then of the, of, of the performance management approach, because we found that only 19 staff out of nearly 20,000 completed appraisals were assessed as unsatisfactory performers. So the system, we feel, doesn't sufficiently ensure performance shortcomings are, are, are rectified, um, improved over time, or indeed that learning and development needs are, are maximized and the opportunities met. So we, we, we concluded that a radical overhaul um, of both the approach and the culture attributable to the process is required. To put it another way, and, and I wrote this in, in the brief quite, quite deliberately because Connor reminded me of it, one of the stakeholders we spoke to commented, is satisfactory really what we want from ourselves and colleagues? Um, and that, 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 that resonated with us. Um, on leadership, the development of leaders is fundamental to, to driving change and improvement. We find that leadership needs to be significantly strengthened across the, the civil service to really deliver the change and transformation required um, by this report. Uh, by the findings of the RHI inquiry and indeed by the civil services own people strategy through to the year 2021. There were low staff approval rates in the people surveys carried out of civil servants in the areas of leadership and change management categories. So there's re really a particular need to focus on enhancing the leadership skills and the standards as part of the future considerations to really get it into the right space in terms of its capability. 
the final area of findings then was to take a look at you know, the work that currently has been done to transform the service um, and to deliver the people strategy. So despite significant reorganization since 2006, um, the aim of having a centralized and effective HR function with sustained capability and transparent governance arrangements uh, in the service, it hasn't been achieved. So there's a need for more clarity uh, on the roles and responsibilities of the various stakeholders and the centralized support mechanisms on the, the HR and the OD delivery model. And we can't emphasize that enough, that need for role clarity. Given the current pressures and without the appropriate investment in a change program, it is difficult to see how the service and next HR can drive the transformation wanted and needed to achieve that meaningful progress in delivering its people strategy, which will be absolutely key to building the enhanced capacity and, and capability across the service, which is accepted by everyone. This is a bit which, is, which relates into um, business that, that your committee has already has already looked closely at on a couple of occasions in recent months. But the current HR contract, the, the HR Connect contract, I should say, which provides the transactional uh, human resources service for the civil service departments and other participating bodies, it's scheduled to expire in March 2021. The civil service has announced its intention to procure a replacement co contract. Um, for that shared service and work has commenced on the procurement activities that will be necessary to, to achieve a replacement, um, as well as considering contingency arrangements to maintain the continuity of services. However, uh, the Department of Finance acknowledges that this process won't be completed on time. It informed us that a contract modification is being sought under the public contract regulations, but the length of the extension at this stage is still undecided. The initial contract has been operational for 15 years, so in our opinion, sufficient time should have been available to plan for a refreshed procurement. We also find um, evidence that the working relationship between NixHR and HR Connect has not always operated effectively, uh, particular weaknesses around the, the joined up governance structures. So coming out of all of those findings, that led us on members to our recommendations. Um, Breadth and depth of this particular report is probably represented in its size. It runs to over 80 pages, but most significantly, it's represented in the number of recommendations. It's a wee bit of a blockbuster. We, we've actually got um, 21 recommendations in there, which is, is considerably in excess of where we normally landed, as you know, in, in our numbers on recommendations, but we felt it was very necessary with the report of this nature. We grouped the recommendations into themes, covering on, in no particular order, uh, leadership governance and transformation, workforce planning, uh, review of resourcing, vacancy management process, skills, performance management, talent management, learning and development. So we worked really closely with the departmental officials to ensure that the, the pitch and focus of those recommendations will generate most impact and lead to real and, and beneficial change. The recommendations are far ranging across the whole service. They have a mix of strategic and operational emphasis. But clearly, there is a, a need for some major um, strategic reform. So, in the executive summary, and I'm nearly at the end, members, in the executive summary and the media release, Kieran stated uh, the civil service has made progress in some areas, but urgency, pace, and investment in strategic workforce planning, organizational development, and people management are all required. This report specifically highlights the need for more collaborative working and strong collective leadership across the service. A real opportunity exists for a new head of the civil service and the permanent secretaries to use this report's findings and recommendations to substantially transform the service and its culture and improve outcomes for citizens, given the immense value that attaches to the work of public servants and has the opportunity to drive this forward. So in summary, the, these, these are not issues for um, XHR as a function or indeed for the Department of Finance to address alone. It will require leadership um, across the whole of the Northern Ireland civil service. We do, of course, expect, though, that the Department of Finance will be a key driver um, in transformation and the XHR will be a key enabling function. Um, however, we've made a, a very explicit recommendation um, stating that there should be absolute clarity on who will oversee the transformation required and that it is imperative also that it is sufficiently resourced. So, in conclusion, Chairman, there's an expectation amongst some um, that reviews and recommendations can um, sit on the shelf a bit, gathering, gathering dust, 
we believe this particular piece of work is very timely and that the considerations of the committee in, in association with the recommendations stemming from the RHI inquiry will act as a real catalyst now to, to, to drive transformation and, and generate a modern fit for purpose civil service that's equipped to deliver the best outcomes for its citizens. Um, the service is crucial to the delivery of public services. If it doesn't have the right capacity and capability, then it will lead to inferior citizen experience, inefficiencies, and indeed delays, which have the potential all to result in um, poor value for money. And that would be our, our, our verbal brief, Chairman, and thank you for um, persevering. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Allen, for your, um, your brief. Um, I have to say that listening to you and following the, the media coverage last week, looking at the recommendations, this report is um, damning and stark on the civil service, I have to say. Um, before I bring members in, there, there are a couple of questions that I might like to ask yourself uh, and your colleagues. But before I, I move on to questions, um, Mr. McGowan, Ms. Burns, do you have anything you want to add to what Mr. Allen has said? Um, no, I think that that's been very comprehensive. Um, it's a very wide ranging, um, largely scoped um, report. Uh, with an extensive amount of recommendations. And it's just our hope that um, the civil service and those at the, the top of the civil service in terms of leadership will take it and run with it and make the significant improvements that are required to make the civil service the organization that it needs to be. Okay. And that's really my hope for it. Thanks, Mr. McGowan. Do you think you want to add? Uh, Chair, on the stage, thank you. Okay. Um, Ronnie, in terms of what you've, you've just said and the work, a piece of work that you've carried out and presented in this report, um, what, what would be your response if I was to ask you, given the RHI inquiry and the lessons learned and the Coglum, or the Coglum report and the RHI, RHI inquiry, do you believe, le believe lessons have been learned at this stage? I, th I would respond, Chairman, that I believe the lessons have been learned. I don't believe I don't believe that the actions have been taken to address those lessons. Mm. Well, it, it's a bit it's a bit like a team that, that takes the, the field that has an, an inherent problem of conceding goals. If it doesn't address the issue, how to stop the ball the, the ball end up in the back of the net, then the result will always be the same, uh, and and that's the reality. And that leads me on to, to the You've scored more than the net, Yeah, uh, and that leads me on to the. Uh, the, the issue of the, the contract which expires next year, but it won't be the, 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 the work to uh, deal with the replacement contract won't be completed on time. Uh, 15 years the contract's been in place, and 15 years isn't long enough to carry out the work for the replacement contract to be scoped out. Um, did they give you at all an indication as to when that work will be completed? Did they give you a timeline? No, they, did, they, they, they didn't, Chairman, and actually it's one of the projects that's included in, in written briefing that you've received, I think, just in correspondence today or yesterday that the committee hasn't considered yet, but no, there's, there's been no timeline made available to us. And, and finally, before I bring members in, in terms of agency cost, up by 155%, if I'm right, uh, and took down your, your, your quote correctly, um, £46 million pounds overspend. £150 million pounds in terms of agency workers in four years. Um, that, that, I mean, when you look at it, I mean, the absolute cost that that is and the opportunity cost to Northern Ireland PLC of what that money could be spent on is, is just absolutely huge in terms of the public purse for, for a country the size of Northern Ireland. Huge. 155% increase on a £150 million pounds Bill over four years. In terms of the, in terms of then, I'm also concerned when I hear you say that um, appointments weren't made weren't made because there were individuals who there were individuals whom they might like to be appointed. I thought we'd reached the point in Northern Ireland that there was a meritocracy. Any discrimination is whether that be deemed positive discrimination. Any discrimination is exactly that. It's discrimination. Um, okay, um, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for your report. But I just want to go back to the start a bit in terms of 
you say um, I'd call it a workforce model because I mean we we come down by fifteen percent in terms of the voluntary ex exit scheme, and I'm just wondering uh, as you delved in to do your reporting exactly the workforce model that was there because I mean you've lost a lot of capacity there as well a lot of experience, which has led to some of the problem following on down the other part. I just want to talk a wee bit about the actual workforce model, what we knew. Uh, what was in place for the transfer of 12 down to nine departments? Can you can you just expand a wee bit on that or what you've learned from that? Uh, yeah, uh, I'll probably invite Connor, if, you, if, if you're content, Mr Boylan, to come in on that point. Um, but first of all, I think really we, we didn't go too far back into the old uh, 12 department model. Um, but regardless, what we find was representative of the current position, um, which I I, I would hesitate to suggest may not have been that much different when it was 12 departments relative to nine. And we presented to you um, a picture there where, in our opinion, um, certainly across the service, workforce planning isn't in place. Now, I know when the witnesses in the, from the department come to talk to you next week, they will be able to explain how they are currently addressing that. Um, but it hasn't been the position to date. Uh, there, there are clearly some departments that were better placed than others, but you can see both from my verbal brief, the report and the information that we have provided. Um, what we find particularly disappointing was that some, some departments weren't even in the position of assessing their needs by headcount, let alone skill set. So that, that mix and match between the capacity relative to that richer aspect of, of the capability and the skills and experience just wasn't there and wasn't, wasn't on the table. Um, Connor, maybe if I invite you and you speak with a bit more authority than me in this area. Thank you, Rodney. Um, yeah, yeah. Just to confirm, we didn't go back. Um, the scope of this report was, um, as you can see, quite wide ranging, um, and so we didn't go back and assess previous departmental workforce planning arrangements. Um, and so, really, it's a state of play now. Um, I suppose the departments were created in the in new form in, in 2016. Um, so I suppose it, it is quite damning still um, that prior to 2019-20, the five of the departments didn't have a, any form of sort of formal workforce plan in place um, some three years, um, three years later. Um, and just to reiterate that, you know, it, we're very much at the start of, and Rodney might have used this terminology earlier, very much at the start of the journey, I suppose. Um, the new template will, will provide a baseline, um, a very important baseline in terms of, of headcount, but um, there will be time taken to, to develop and enhance the, the, the skills aspect to, to the workforce planning template going forward. No, I appreciate that. And, and I asked in that context because it seems to me the model run the whole way through and there was an opportunity as you reduce the departments to look at the actual workforce model. That I only asked it in that context. Uh, could you come in there, Chair? Uh, I think it's probably charitable to actually say there was a workforce model at any time. So we're looking at the workforce model today, and uh, we're saying three or four departments can have produced draft plans. That's today. Uh, so it's been a, a poorly developed discipline, not just today, but over many years. Now, uh, we did a report a few years back on the voluntary exit scheme. Uh, and I think 4,000 staff are stripped out of the service at that stage. And I suppose the mood point, when you strip that many staff out of a system, then you need a plan and, and you need a new business model. And I don't think a new business model was created. Uh, like uh, my own small organisation, we, we shed quite, quite a few st staff as well, but we couldn't have actually worked it without actually completely transforming our business model. So uh, there's just been a dearth of, you know, sophisticated staff modelling, not just today, but for many, many years. And, and Chair, that's why I, I brought that question up, because it's important. That's why we're here at this point, and, and thanks for that. Because I wanted to go on, because you see, you're saying here there's 1,420 vacancies. Now, in, in theory and in fact, that's what there is. But unless you have a proper workforce model in place, we don't know exactly how many we need, or even the 22,000. But Chair, I just want to make that point. But there's a couple of wee key points in terms of the, the issue of young people and entering the, in terms of the report, what have you found in trying to get 
young people in particular in the, in the service because obviously they would be the future of the service. Um, and, and another point, um, well, just that, if you can answer that, please, in terms of the young people, whoever wants to take that. Yes, I, I come in again, Chairman. Um, it, it, it would be an excellent question for next week if I if I could be so bold, but I'll give you our critique on it at this stage. I think we were shocked, uh, to be fair. Um, certainly, the county officer and others were shocked was that start as that stat started to come to the forefront um, that there were uh, less than one percent under the age of um, twenty four. Um, I have to declare a bit of a personal interest here as someone who started the, the, their own career in, in the service for the first six years of my, my working life in that age bracket. Um, um, certainly back at that time, it was a much more diverse and, and younger uh, civil service. Um, there, there are quite, quite significant moves of it to be, to be fair to the system, um, which they can talk about next week uh, by way of uh, recruitment of apprentices um, recruitment of graduates, um, and by apprentices I mean school leavers moving into that space of bringing um, higher level apprentices into the service at, at that age, maybe of around about 17, um, which we welcome and value. But you can see by the stats that it's going to take some time to turn that around. Um, because if you look at one of the, the appendices in the report, um, actually if you drill down in a bit more detail, it might be from about age 35 up. Um, the sheer number of, of folks that, that fall into that bracket, and indeed the number of folks that also fall into greater than age 60, and that's fine. As we know, there is no retirement age, but it is interesting to look at the stats in terms of the people at the, the other end, uh, end of the scale. Christine Connor. Yeah. No, I concur with that. Um, obviously, they are. Uh, I think one of the problems is that there's been a period where there was a moratorium as well on recruitment. And as a result of that, they haven't actually been able to recruit and fill these gaps. Um, but it, su it suggests that this has been running for a long period of time. And it's only now, 2019 and current day, that they've actually woke up to what the problem actually is. And they've started to reignite some of these initiatives. Because obviously, we're talking about the graduate scheme there. I mean, that was in place. And then basically, it was stopped. And now they're, they're, they're going to rekindle that as well. So I think... I think they nearly lost sight of what the structure, how the structure was developing, and the fact that it had lost, sorry, its youth, and um, it was actually moving towards uh, a, an old structure, and therefore they weren't bringing in new skills and new, you know, to motivate and sort of grow the service. But I must say, as, you, as Rodney said, there, you know, they have actually, you know, taken that on board, and things are developing, and they've got the SOs and the AO competitions and various competitions to try and fill the gaps as well as that to attract what they think is new blood into the service. Thank you. Okay, Mr O'Toole. Thank you. Um, thank you all. This um, report's really important uh, and it's going to be important um, obviously um, going forward for the next while. Just on a few specific things, um, on the 45% uh, over the age of 50 and the 1% between 16 and 24, how does that compare both to civil service across the water and south of the border? Or other services generally, it doesn't have to be on these islands, but comparable bureaucracies? Um, Connor, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to you to, as to whether we have that to hand or not. I certainly don't. But just while Connor's looking at can I just check something, Chairman? Or, or, and excuse me, my, my ignorance. Are we in open or closed session at, at the moment? No, no, we are in, we're in open session at the moment. If there, are, if, if there are issues that, that that you don't want to go into, we will have a closed session um, later on. But as I made clear before we started, we are in open session at the moment. Chair, does that mean that we're questions? That if there are questions, as I said to members, do not go into questions that are that are in, in your packs as, as being marked as confidential, because it's not fair to ask um, officials to answer them. Those are those should be um, retained for the closed session. So if there's issues you're not comfortable in answering, any of the of the guests we have in front of us today, um, please keep them for closed session and and and, and deal with it that way, if you don't mind. No worries. But that, okay. um, as you say, that's that, um, to both Rodney and Connor. That see, you're, you're not you're, you're helping. You're not giving us evidence. So if you don't have the information immediately at hand, you can share. It's not. Um, yeah, and I would just point out, you know, do not use or place questions today to that are actually questions for civil servants next week. I think that's important to to to, to make that point. Okay. 
Thank you. So, so the other um, the other thought that, that occurred to me is this thing around functional skills. So there are professions, Annex 2 has a list of mixed professions, but the next step is a, is, is um, you talk, you know, the, the functional skill sets that sit beneath those and interact with them. What is it that's really missing? Is it that there's a, is it that there are a list of professions, but they're just recruiting people, you know, so obviously there are policy generalists and communications people who will have a, but you know, for example, they're recruiting economists. Are they recruiting economists who have economics degrees, uh, but they're not producing a properly thought through functional skill set for those economists that interact with the workforce plan? Yeah, a very interesting question. Um, I suppose uh, one of the things thrown up in the RHI inquiry: yes, uh, you had a lot of economists at the table, uh, but you need economists with business and commercial skills. So. Uh, there's a week, plenty of economists, uh, but a big gap in terms of uh, commercial skills and to look at projects commercially. And I think that's recognised, uh, certainly recognised in Whitehall, where, where they have greatly strengthened the, you know, the, their commercial arm. Uh, and that's also important uh, when government is um, doing big deals with, uh, you know, multinational firms and blue chip PLCs, uh, we need a level playing field there. And just because somebody is a, an economist or an accountant, they will not necessarily have the commercial skills to do those deals. That's just one example. Yeah. Um. Just to come in, if I, if I may there, um, Matthew, um, so re really the point that you've raised in the economist is, a, is right on the money because um, the, the way that the economist profession Acts um, in Northern Ireland. It's actually not dissimilar to the way uh, the functions are set up in, in GB. And we talk about that GB model. We're putting it out there as one. There, there, there could well be others, but we particularly like it. So what am I? What I mean by that? Well, in GB, you, you as a as a person who has a skill set within a function, you're appointed to the function, and then you are seconded out from that function to the department. But there's quite a subtle difference in, in culture there because. You feel a member of the function providing um, a skill and a, and a service, a particular service, to the individual department. You don't necessarily feel you don't feel as if you're a member of the department. That actually is very is the model which the economists use um, in a, in our in our 24 professions in Northern Ireland. But but it's it's a wee bit out on its own in that respect. Um, so if you pick some of those most of those other professions, they operate in a very different way. Um, whereas I. What we're trying to suggest is that we were particularly taken by Kieran's point that model, which is in GB, um, which we believe would be a better model. And certainly the, the, the functions and the skills that they have, as I outlined in the oral brief, um, they're, they're in areas that seem to be much more modern relative perhaps to uh, our existing list of um, 24 professions in, in Northern Ireland. Although they are, they're definitely in GB. I do speak from personal experience. They are much more. Some of them are much more developed than others. So I was a member of the government communications profession in Whitehall, which was not as well developed, uh, arguably because communications is not as much of a profession as, for example, the um, uh, the the uh, people who did well, economists probably, or or for that matter, HR specialists. Um, I, I think that, I just can, as well, if I may. I think that's very important because it's good to hear that. That's the situation we have with our professions. Um, some are more much more developed than others, and in our opinion, that comes back to um, time and resource that's going in to the professions. And and you do find. I mean, we find this. We we did reach out to professions, and and most of them are headed up by like a grade three member of staff, um, and and some were very good to engage with us, but one or two simply couldn't. No doubt because they had other bigger important priorities on their plate. So they don't have the time themselves as head of professions to engage in developing the profession because they're they're arguably so focused on the day job. And then, so I, I um, I only have a couple more. Thank you, Chair. For um, the question I was going to ask versus on the graduate scheme and what why was the why was the graduate scheme stopped? It seems to, stopping a graduate scheme seems a very good way to um, contribute to the aging of the overall civil service, but also ensure that you're not getting, frankly, kind of energised people in their twenties and thirties. 
which it, which yeah, which yeah, it I, I think Christine come in on that one in a wee, in a wee second. Um, um, but, but really, I suppose the language that we've used is the fast track scheme, um, and, and Christine could be a wee bit more specific on on when it dropped out, dropped out and why it dropped out. But we were quite alarmed um, that that it wasn't being used, um, and even our own office had, had, in a very small way, participated as part of that scheme um, in the past by by having someone deployed with us. Um, Christine. Uh, we didn't go into an awful lot of detail. It was just um, when we, we talked about them and what they were trying to do, talk to the department and, and how they were trying to develop the, the, the youth into the actual, um, bring more you know young people into the service. And I think it was really, they were piggybacking on the back of the GB scheme. And then I think there was uh, there was issues around how they were recruiting for the GB scheme and it didn't facilitate Northern Ireland to the way that they would hoped. So therefore they then um, sort of removed themselves from the scheme. However, my understanding is now going forward that they have like re re-engaged and there, there will be specific fast track schemes. So I think it was just a situation whereby the opportunities were there, but they weren't suitable at the time. And uh, there was, I don't know the detail in round as to why they weren't suitable, but they, they stopped the, the process, but now they're re-engaging. So um, they're hoping to take that forward in the near future. Uh, I'll just come in there. My reading of this, Chair, the, uh, it was sort of shelved for low level operational reasons. It wasn't a strategic decision. Uh, I was actually, I couldn't believe it when I, I thought the scheme was still running and I, I was absolutely shocked when I heard it, it was no longer going because it's been there for many, many years. Particularly as an issue of impressed, I mean, there is a, I don't know, I'm sort of putting this to you as a, as a proposition, but there is clearly an issue with morale that you rightly got to in this report uh, and that contributes to that contributes performance, it contributes to sick leave, but there's also that morale thing to a, a, a question of it whether it is seen particularly by you know, a certain cohort of graduates as a, pre a prestigious, dynamic, interesting place you want to go and work, and I'm not sure it is. Uh, a really important question, Chair, because one of the related issues here is the delay and the time it takes to run competitions. And if you are uh, you know, an ambitious fast track graduate, uh, you know, you not have a very good impression of the system. So I think a great amount of work needs to be done to uh, make the proposition attractive, uh, you know, to talented people. I think this is really important because I think if we're all honest ourselves, I think about the issues of brain drain and graduates, I will make a statement here. I think if people were honest and they thought about someone who was getting a, it's not just about graduates, it's about getting people at all levels, but it does matter in terms of the <coughs> reputation and the delivery of the thing overall that, Someone who's about to graduate with a, it's not just about high level graduates, but it is important to think about someone who's graduating with a first from Queen's University. They're thinking about the prestigious career, you know, the kind of career they want to get, the demanding, rewarding career. Someone in, for example, graduating from a, with a first in England or a, for that matter in Dublin would probably naturally consider a career in the centre. I'm not sure they would as much here, and I think that's a, a hard question that we should be. People in terms of overall delivery and, and the people who are going on to leadership positions in the civil service. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. Uh, <coughs> just on the agency stuff, uh, firstly, I was he critical of the the, the usage there? Um, on, the, on the under on the under 24s, I think he said there was one percent just of the workforce were under 20. Does that include agency workers, or are they set separate? That, um, that, that excludes Connor. Get me right here in case I say something that's completely wrong. But that that excludes the agency staff. That's permanent employees only. Right, and that, that's very interesting because if that was a private firm out in their constituencies, there would be knocking the doors down, asking to give young people a permanent job after they've been there two, three, four years. It's just it's a very unsatisfactory way to obviously uh, work. On, on figure five of the of the report, there, there's obviously worrying aspects to that. Some more than others. There's there's three three big increases there of DERA, DFE, and, and DFC. Uh, but, but there was a there was a, a positive uh, result that the TEO was, was was there anything there that had changed compared to the other departments, or was do you think was that a fluke? Or <laughs> how how did those Pan, pan out. Yes, I, 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 
Uh, when they, I, 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 did, uh, I did ask and, and query that with TEO to see whether there were any um, specific initiatives that, that were were under undertaken there, but um, um, there, there was no meaningful, you know, feedback or, or initiatives that, you know, representing necessarily good practice that could be disseminated across the rest of the departments. So, um, and so we left it there. Just a fluke now. The, the only little, the only thing I would add is, is, is it may be, and we don't, we clearly don't have the analysis. It could be a fluke, um, Mr. Hillage. But if you look at Appendix One of the report, um, TEO is, a, is not necessarily a, a typical department by way of, of grade structure. Obviously, it's very small relative to to others. But you'll see, for instance, what I mean by that, you'll see, for instance, um, that TEO has has twenty four uh, senior civil servants. Um, whereas the likes of a, a very large, say, DFC, um, has 25. So, you know, there may be something just to, to read in there that's relevant to the point you're making. And, and, the, and the large increase of percentage ways at DERA, was there anything there that was good on? Again, it's figure five. Yeah, yeah um, uh, Rodney, if I could come in there. To just again on, on that one, um, the, the data vacancies are very much in, in relation to the Brexit posts uh, and, and the impact that that has had on, on, on the, the, the work that they undertake and the, the real large range of preparations needed really for the, for the planning of, of that transition. Yeah, that's just around the corner. Yeah, yeah, we've got a wee bit of narrative on that, um, David, just in, in the first bullet point at 3.9. Okay. Yep, thank you. Cheers, thank you. Mr. Muir, um, thank you very much, Chair. I um, don't know where to start with this. <laughs> um, number of things, in terms of the staffing and the, the headcount that the civil service has at the moment, how does that compare to other civil services within the SILES? Uh, it is higher, uh, Chair, and uh, some we touched on when we did our voluntary exit report. So we have more people employed in Northern Ireland in the public service per head of population than elsewhere. Um, I don't have a precise figure, but I can no. get you one. In terms of all the issues that are here, who's ultimately responsible for t turning this around? Very good question. Uh, I think there's such a big job here uh, that, that it, it has to go to the top to the, to the new head of the services because this crisscrosses the, the entire system. So it, it needs a commitment uh, really from the entire you know civil service board across the piece. Okay, something to be picked up next week because I'm not filled with any confidence because we don't have a head of the civil service. Um, to, be, to, to be fair around that point though, there was criticism that we didn't have a head of the civil service, no appointment made. To be fair in this report, it may not be a bad thing as things have panned out. I'll hand back to you. I know. <laughs> That's agreed. Um, there was three departments that said they didn't have a workforce plan in place. What, what departments were they? <clears throat> Can you give me the briefing paper? I'm just looking now, Rodney. Just to be sure. We'll pick that up for you, Mr. Muir, and come back on it. Oh, that's no problem. Um, and also, in relation to the temporary promotions, which we've touched upon, is there not a level of risk that we actually have people in those posts <laughs> potentially leading very important projects but aren't suitably qualified to do it? Absolutely, there is potential for that. Hundred percent. That's a, that's probably a good line of questioning for next week, given the, the extensive use of um, of agency staff of temporary positions and indeed the very long instances of um, acting up temporary promotions. Um, and there's an issue here about the SID, and it said it's, uh, it was in your briefing paper that uh, stakeholder engagement also identified governance and accountability concerns regarding departments not effectively monitoring and scrutinising the work of SIB staff deployed in their organisations. 
it, it, it mentions, I don't know whether you want to do this in public session or closed, but it says stakeholder engagement. What, 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 what stakeholders were they? Or, or just a bit more information about where this has came to light? I'd be very happy to pick that in, that in closed, Mr. Mayor. Um, um, and the, the last one's just around the procurement issue. Um, did you get any satisfaction of the rationale why it's been left that they're going to have to get a contract extension? No, and to be fair now, we have not um, probed this at any great depth, but we felt given particularly what the committee has been considering in recent months, that we flagged it for your for your attention, but um, it wasn't really within the scope of the, the, the study. Um, but it's very pertinent to other business. Yeah, it's quite a serious issue. I have another question for a private session, which is about the performance ratings issue and what happens if you get an unsatisfactory rating. We can explain. We give you a brief on that as well, Mr. Muir. Mm. Thank you. Um, just before bringing other members in, can I ask um, some people sitting on temporary contracts, temporary posts for four years? Yes. Um, 22,000 staff. 19 of them who were deemed unsatisfactory in terms of their performance. Are these self, are these forms that you fill in yourself? I mean, how on, who, how on earth do we have a situation that 19 out of 22,000 are unsatisfactory in their performance? That actually makes a complete laughing stock in the civil service. Field. How, that, how, that's how, an how, assessment how, given by the line manager, Chairman. Right. <laughs> Just the one? I'm being flippant, but, it, you know, <laughs> of, a, of a staff of 22,000, really, 19 people unsatisfactory? Says it all. Mr. McHugh. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, ways, uh, thank you for your statement as well. Very informative in many ways, but it's probably maybe indicative of a malaise that's within the civil service right across it. Um, and some of my comments just might be more relevant again to, to next week. Uh, in relation to what probably be one of the headline items for the general public, and that is sick leave and how it compares then uh, with other areas and that as well. And I know that in the report itself, you're probably not making a judgment about why it is that uh, the sick leave is so high. But uh, is it uh, sort of because of the age and workforce? Is it reflective maybe of um, that type of leadership which seems to be wanting uh, currently in the civil service? Uh, is it reflective of maybe people being totally unhappy, we'll say, uh, at their work because of lack of opportunity or otherwise within the civil service? And you know, it's always very, very easy for one to sort of say, well, the reason why you have high sick leave is because they get paid whenever they're off sick. And I know that from my past working experience that that wasn't actually the case. Uh, you always would have had an individual, maybe they would have abused the sick leave that they would have been entitled to in any one year. But for the greater part of uh, the workforce, uh, they're usually a whole lot more or rather they show more integrity than that as well too. So how reflective is it of this uh, malaise that exists within maybe the civil service itself? Uh, Chair Vang, come in on that one. Um, I just need to say as well, uh, we published a separate report mm. on sickness acts that was out this week. Yeah. We, we touch on it in Rodney's report, but we go into more detail on it in this week's report. Uh, I suppose it is a complicated uh, I suppose the, the average uh, in Northern Ireland civil service is 13 days. So that uh, has crept up this last couple of years. And um, some of the points you mentioned there are relevant to it. Obviously, the, uh, the age structure of the workforce is a factor. So if you have an older workforce, uh, they, don't be, they don't take more occasions off, but when people, older people are off, they tend to be off for longer. So it is a factor in terms of what I call long-term absence as opposed to short-term, mm -hmm. and this long-term actually is, is an issue here. Uh, mental health is, is also an issue. It's called a, as one of the, the big factors. But management and leadership is also an issue. And uh, I think it's important that uh, the problem isn't just explained away. 
in terms of uh, either mental health or uh, the structure of the population, because some organisations actually manage th this issue better than others. Uh, so, and um, with good leadership and management and attendance management, certainly a good dent can be made. I can bring the figures down to what they are elsewhere, but can certainly make a difference. Uh, just in addition, Chair, just uh, if I can go on there, just and again to now in relation to uh, agency staff and clarity for for myself in this respect. But often I have seen that whenever temporary staff, let's say, and in fact it comes a wee bit like the agency staff, were brought into an organisation, uh, and I uh, identified totally. Uh, with comments already made that where they can be redundant, but they're there for three, four, and five years, and you would question very seriously, okay, what is the organisation about in the first instance? But one of the main reasons it usually was forwarded, apart from just filling the gap, was say because of uh, lack of uh, personnel, uh, it also was argued that it worked out cheaper in the long run. Uh, because of the lack of commitment on the part of the organisation, we'll say to things like pension or, 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 or otherwise. Now, is that the case in the civil service as well too? Whilst these costs are very high for agency staff and so on, in the long run, is it actually cheaper to employ them rather than to have them in full-time employment? There are certain circumstances uh, where, you know, Employing temporary staff makes sense. So, you say in the um, Social Security Agency, there's a, a big kink in work uh, with welfare reform, more staff needed for a short period. So, that would make sense. Uh, but uh, that's quite different from uh, using temporary solutions to fill what are substantive permanent posts. Yeah. Well, and which brings me to the final question to the Chair, just is that, uh, and that will say, being the case, um, do we have any indication at all about how many of uh, these same agency staff have been offered full-time posts within the civil service or who have ever even applied for a full-time post within the civil service uh, and maybe didn't get it whenever they had applied say, for a full-time post but were still employed then on an agency basis? We, we, we don't have that, Mr. McHugh, but again, I think that's a very good question for, for your evidence session next week. Okay, Mr. Bates. Thank you, Chair. Again, thanks for the, the briefing so far. Um, strikes me there's some very basic failings, um, lack of uh, workforce planning, high level of vacancies, high level of temporary promotions deficiencies and recruitment process, all that were very, very basic and very, very obvious. So I'm just curious uh, why nothing was done. Um, and I dare say related to that thing in your own mind is, is there just an, an acceptance by those involved that this is the system and that's it? Uh, and did you, in, in your studying of this area, did you come across many uh, involved who came from a different world, a private sector, who, who have had to react um, to, to pressures faster or go out of business. So, so is there a reasonable mix of people involved in recruitment uh, within the civil service or is it everyone working their way up through the system in, in, the, in the public sector with limited outside experience of what's happening elsewhere? Okay, um, a couple of things, or I'll try and take them, uh, and, then, and then the other guys will come in, um, I'm sure. For the first point, Mr. Biggs, if you see there, and I'm uh, just looking it up, figure two on page 16 of our report kind of tries to articulate the responsibility and accountability framework. Um, it took us a long time to get that particular picture on half a page worked up, um, which I think is a prime indication of back to a point I made in the, in the verbal brief, the lack of clarity around the roles and responsibilities and the structure and indeed how HR works across an organisation of, of 22,000 um, 22, people. Um, the, the, the simple answer to your, your, your second point on, um, on the diversity, I suppose, is the word that I would use. Um, the simple answer would have been no, um, that, 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 that in the main, 
development and progression was coming from within. However, um, because it, it had stagnated for many years, voluntary exit meant that people weren't being recruited, etc. However, um, as, as we've mentioned in the report, the, the service has opened up over the past, say, 12 months and moved out into open recruitment. Um, so it is now attracting people in from the marketplace with different skill sets, uh, different ages, uh, different backgrounds, different career paths, um, uh, particularly in the round deputy principal, staff officer, and now there's an ongoing very active competition at administrative officer level. So um, again, I would expect that the department next week would, would want to talk to you about that um, because that should drive some of the change so that, that is absolutely necessary, necessary, we feel, as a result of um, the findings in this report. Connor, Christine? So can I just say... Sorry, sorry. go ahead, Christine. All I was just going to say is that um, I think what's happened is there's been this like strategy overload and various things within the system. And you have things like People's Strategy 2013, you know, and you have like, um, various new delivery models. And then there's a transformation and then they do a bit and then we're back to a new people strategy 2018 2021 so i think we it's a case of like you, you nearly have to sort of say well okay what's gone before is gone before and we now have to start and look at what exactly needs to be done and drive it forward because i think there's all of these initiatives that are, are you know occur and it's not just within the, the, the sort of the general civil service it's like within health within education and you do get this overload of initiative. And I think now it's a case of like identify what the key issues are and start to drive those forward and like start afresh almost. Yeah, uh, and I would just add um, and to that dur during the, clear the clearance process, um, which was slightly protracted on, on this report, um, but there were no surprises. Um, and I think there was a recognition within the service that yes these are the the key strategic issues that that, that need need to be addressed long standing and um, you, you could argue um but that there's a recognition that they, they need to be addressed and so i'm hopeful now and certainly the team are hopeful that this report provides the real impetus and um, they might be basic um long standing issues but actually they're going to require a, a huge amount of um uh, focus strategic focus uh, and direction um, we're really hopeful that uh, you know this report will will provide the impetus for that. Okay. I just 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 to add that, Mr. Beggs, the the that bought me a wee bit of time just to find the stats I was looking for. But those competitions that are referred to that are running at the moment, the intention is to to, to appoint fourteen hundred um, permanent recruits. Now, not all of those will come from that external competition. Uh, the stats previously have shown that maybe to date about a third of, of the candidates have been external. So clearly, clearly there is a talent base within the existing workforce um, that, that has been securing around about two thirds of those posts. Um, and that's fine. And the mix is very appropriate. But as you can see, that just dislodges the problem to somewhere else. So it's going to take quite some time to fill all of these vacancies uh, and, and get the skills um, and the numbers in place. OK, thank you, Mr. Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Alt. Just thinking a um, bigger picture here of your 31 recommendations. Um, some of them people would maybe call quick wins, but obviously some of them more achievable than others. Many you recommend would be achievable of the 31 in an acceptable time. <laughs> um, I would love to say every single one. Um, uh, I suppose um, if, if, if I was asked to prioritise what was most important, and, and as a team we were we were kind of we were chatting about this a bit in a, in a sense because it, it almost you know it's, we don't want to prioritise, but okay, you've put me on the spot. I suppose for me, the, the, the leadership, the delivery model is coming uh, to my mind top of the list. You know, if you, if you can get that strategic side of it into the right place. Um, the recommendations in and around skills in and around recruitment um, in and around temporary solutions and vacancy management and even absenteeism um, should follow. So I'm not giving you a direct answer because to be fair, I think it is one for, for um, the department. But indirectly, I'm trying to suggest that 
the real speed and urgency should go into those strategic recommendations. No, that's exactly what I was thinking. You get two or three of the big ones right there, and the rest sort of follow along. Is that right? Yep. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Ms Flynn. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, and I had actually just scribbled down on my page as I was going over the recommendations. Um, in section one, <coughs> in, if, if you don't or you can't implement the first recommendation, then there isn't much hope for the others, to, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, so recommendation 1.2, um, where it says exceptionally strong leadership and a collective commitment is required to implement the, the, the transformation that, that needs to be done. But it sounds good and it looks good, but how do you break that down? And it's similar to what Andrew had touched on earlier on. Um, you know, what, what, what does that strong leadership or that collective commitment actually mean? So does it entail all the stakeholders as listed? Um, you know, does responsibility fall on the lay with the head of the the civil service, um, or on on the the the, the, bo the board, um, and on recommendation one point three, where it was saying there should be absolute clarity on who will oversee the transformation required. You know, when I read that, the first thing I thought of was was it unclear? Um, you know. <laughs> who had overall responsibility beforehand and that may seem like really I don't know it seems like I'm stating the obvious asking that but it's the first thing that jumped out when when I read it I wasn't sure um you know because obviously I think all of the recommendations genuinely are long-term transformative you know um changes that need to be implemented so just on, on the rating of the first few, it was sort of like you're rating it and it sounds good and it looks good, but it seems almost obvious that, that the leadership and the clarity would have been in place before yeah. now, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Um, what I always get worried about in recommendations that um, others will tick the box and this, we buy into all of this and whatever, but it's a deeper commitment uh, as probably between the lines of this, uh, it's taken a, a deeper cultural change uh, and it's actually tackling maybe bits of cultural resistance to some of these things, uh, particularly maybe issues, uh, Mr. Beggs, you raised the issue of opening up uh, the service and how far is the system prepared to go on that. Uh, Rodney had mentioned some of the changes that, that have been made, but th those are very, very recent. You know, it's in the last 18 months, a <coughs> couple of years. Uh, I suppose we're living with the consequences. Some of that stuff wasn't done over the past decade. Uh, so so there, there's deeper issues in here. And uh, it's not just about tick box and recommendations. Uh, the, the fairly deep work needs to be done on the, on the culture. <coughs> Please, to this point in, in closed session, um, I, I would say, though, that I suppose I take a first simple view. You know, what is the civil service? The civil service is the people that, that make it up. It's the 22,000 people that are contained within it. Um, I take Mr McHugh's point about malaise. But I think there's been a lot of firefighting. Uh, I think we need to recognise that the service has been dealing with um, issues that it didn't even expect to be dealing with. I think it'd be wrong of us not to recognise that there are many, many, many of those public servants, civil servants who have been working exceptionally hard, and no less so over the past eight, nine, nine months. However, anecdotally at least, um, that's not the case necessarily for everybody. And that, of course, brings it back to, you know, you're only as good as the people around you. So the leadership really does need to harness this. You know, if, if as elected representatives, um, understandably, you're looking for every, everything to be delivered within a draft programme for government, um, these are the people that are going to drive it. So to my mind, this trumps everything. You know, you get this right, then you have a wonderful opportunity to get all the initiatives right. And just to follow on, please, Chair. Um, so, yeah, to follow on from that, in recommendation 3.1, um, Rodney, it was talking about um, to place to place the right people in the right posts, and that appointments should be made to roles um, or role categories with essential and desirable criteria. So again, is that 
um, in plan are presuming that the posts and roles were being filled without any criteria, uh, you know, any checks or balances, because again, it just seems like a very basic thing, and if that wasn't being done, then you can imagine how things could get a wee bit chaotic and messy, you know. Yeah, it, 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 it's really, I suppose, what we're driving at there is back to the generalist relative to, I'll use the word, the specialist. It's not necessarily the specialist, it's just the person with specific skills. Um, and, and I must say to the committee, what we're not recommending is that um, that, that, that gen I'm, I'm putting my words here, that, that there's no merit in the general service, because there absolutely is. But I suppose we are, we are questioning um, the numbers of people who are general civil servants. So a couple of very quick thoughts. Um, officials next week will, will point towards um, quite a number of recruitments, uh, particularly more at a senior level, that are done in a, a much more um, sophisticated and testing way with assess assessment centres and two-stage interview pro processes, etc. Um, but what we're driving at in, in 3.1 is to get more emphasis into what is the role, not necessarily just the standalone job, but it might be a role, and that you job spec that role, and you go out, therefore, to the marketplace looking for people that have particular skills to fit into that role. That's not what has been happening. And that role might be something that requires 100, 200 people working in project management, contract management, or something else. But they've got particular skills that, as an organisation, you're going out into the marketplace and trying to attract them for. And that's what we're driving at in, in 3.1. Thank you. Okay. Okay, members. Um, very quick one, Chair. Just for well, very quickly, yes. Thank you, Justin. Was there a specific question about um, the mor the, about morale and like the political dynamic? I don't mean capital P political, but occasionally, like institutions being down for three years, general hostility post RHI, general sort of high level, frankly, of scepticism about the institutions in the public in the public discourse. Did you hear that people found that partic a particular challenge in terms of morale and um, recruitment? I'll take um, yes, Mr. So to, to be honest and frank with you, absolutely. We, it's not something we've, we've, we've majored on in the report at all. Sorry, Karen, I cut across you, but the simple answer is yes, that's out there uh, across the civil servants, yes. Okay, thanks, members. Um, and. Uh, we will obviously deal with some issues in closed session in a few month, moments' time. Um, one of the things struck me, those of us who are uh, obviously working with and have worked with community organisations, when they seek uh, funding from government, when you're sitting in meetings with civil servants and you hear the civil servants telling you, this all has to go to the economists and the economists have to approve this, and there are all these questions about governance and about accountability and about... Um, financial probity and prudence and all of these things are necessary for community organisations that have little or no capacity, no staff perhaps and here we have an organisation that has 22,000 staff and it can't get it right itself but yet lectures community organisations I think the community organisations out there will, will, will be hugely and understandably frustrated but mention has been made of culture and just listening to, to the evidence, five government departments, no workforce plan in place, vacancy rates of 7%, temporary uh, posts, some people sitting in temporary posts for four years, agency costs up 155% at 100 cost to the Northern Ireland taxpayer, £150 million over four years, 19 staff out of 22,000 who received unsatisfactory performance reports and clear lack of skill sets. All this absolutely suggests to me that there is a culture. So now what we'll do, members, is go into closed session and we'll deal with some of these issues that are of a confidential and private nature. So order, we now move to closed session. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.